work. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm the CEO of Mistral AI, and I'm here to uh, guess, give an overview of what we've been doing the last six months. Uh, there won't be a lot of announcement uh, this uh, today because we we announce when we announce. But uh, we'll um, I'll give an overview of what we've been doing. Uh, talk to you about what we are trying to achieve in terms of uh, business development, in terms of technology as well. Uh, the way we've chosen to distribute the technology, which is uh, slightly different from uh, what others have been proposing the last few years. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll be happy to have an open discussion uh, after that, because I think I have 30 minutes, and I probably will be faster than that. So let's see. Um, so our ambition at Mistral AI, which is a company that we started with uh, Guillaume and Timothée, uh, my co-founders, uh, in May, uh, is to develop frontier models, uh, develop the foundational models that, that are behind the AI revolution that we are seeing today, uh, and put them in the hand of uh, real-world application makers. So it's not that easy to take a model and to make a low-latency application that serves a purpose, and this is really what we want to make happen. Um, we think that the one public to talk to uh, in doing that is really the developers, uh, are really the developers. We see in France, we see in Europe, a very large ecosystem of AI builders uh, that would definitely benefit from having deeper access to AI models, and this is uh, our intention, that was our intention when we started the company. It, so. That's the, that was the premise of uh, starting Mistral AI. We, another premise which is very important and cr critical to our DNA is the fact that if you want to talk to developers, if you want to um, enable them to create uh, differentiated applications, you do, give, you do need to give them deep access. And the best way to give deep access to a technology is to do it uh, by releasing open weight models and open source software. We think uh, that this is the correct way of accelerating the technology adoption, and this is what we started doing with our first release that we did uh, at the end of September. That's, I guess, the first premise, which is really the second line here, but I'm realizing that I haven't rehearsed this talk. Um, the training, uh, another premise of our start, uh, is that generative AI can actually be trained uh, much more efficiently than what we've been observing uh, in very large companies. Uh, we've shown that with a very tiny fraction of the compute of our previous employers, uh, we could train models that were competitive and useful for a large variety of tasks. And this is what we started doing, and this is what we will be continuing doing. Um, as I've said, open source is the way to make AI useful. Uh, open source is useful because you can give deep access to models. Having access to model weights is a way of tweaking them to pour one editorial choices, to pour some, some demonstrations, to pour some reward modeling into the models uh, that you have at hand. And this is the way you actually create differentiated applications, much more than if you were to use only closed source APIs that you can't really understand. So that's the premises of where, how we started. Um, we now have a team of 18 people, uh, 19, 20, uh, growing. Uh, and we, we started very, very quickly. Uh, early June, uh, we had five people joining the first day, and the first thing we did was basically recreate the entire stack that is needed to train models. The stack needed to train large language models is data pipelines, training code, uh, leveraging uh, existing clusters uh, that are actually always ta always takes some time to uh, get a hold on them. Uh, we recreated the wall evaluation pipeline from scratch, the inference code as well that we are now shipping to our customers. So that took some time. These were things that we knew how to do because we, we had some experience in that field, but uh, uh, it was still quite a daunting task this summer to recreate it. And we've been doing that. We've been using GPUs as they arrived. Uh, Jensen was here uh, this, uh, this morning, as you all know. Uh, getting access to GPUs is, is not that easy, and so we got them like every week we had a few GPUs coming and we were, we were just plugging them uh, onto our cluster and increasing the speed of our training runs. So Mistral 7B that we released at the end of September is a model that has 7 billion parameters. Um, 
So which means that it's actually small enough to run on a smartphone. Uh, we haven't been doing it, but the community has been adopting it to make it run on iPhone 15 uh, at a reading speed, which is great. Um, and what we've shown with Mistral 7b is that there was still a lot of leeway uh, in making small language models. The open source best models at the time was Llama 2. And as you can see here, the 7b model we made is actually beating Llama 2 13b, so almost two times bigger, uh, on all benchmarks. And that was our target since, um, yeah, we, the target was from day one to do that. Um, I was uh, and Timothée and Guillaume uh, were uh, pioneers in some of the technology uh, uh, for large language models. Uh, in particular, we have a very good understanding of scaling laws. And scaling laws tell you how you basically predict uh, the performance of models based on the amount of compute you put and the size of the model. And so our understanding of these things allowed us to figure out that we could make a model much smaller than what was existing. And so we really targeted this, this size, which is useful for developers because, as I've said, you can run it on iPhone, but you can also run it on MacBook Pros. And it's super easy to have a local deployment of Mistral 7b. And so it's super easy, but still it's useful because it's the capacity of Llama 213b. And if you fine tune it uh, with instruction data, you can get something, you can get a model which is already a pretty good chatbot. Uh, and so we've been seeing a lot of traction around that. And I think this can be imputed to several things. The first thing is that we made it 8-page 2.0, which is uh, a standard open source license and that allowed every company to take it and to integrate it uh, as part of their AI pipeline. The second thing is that it was small enough to be used uh, locally, and it was small enough to be used on very old GPUs that turned out to be the only one available. And it was good enough to be useful. So when you use it as a chatbot, it can be, an it can be quite entertaining. Uh, when you use it for summarization, when you use it for like intermediary tasks that the end user may not see, but that are actually critical uh, to the AI chains that are uh, on which AI applications rely. Well, they're very low latency and they're very low cost. And so uh, we've, we have a few companies that have been adopting it uh, to replace some existing more expensive and more opaque APIs. If you look at, uh, so these are basically what we call scaling laws. Um, on the x-axis, you have the model size. And on the y-axis, you have some form of representation of performance. And usually, these things look more or less like uh, you, you you work on making them uh, look like uh, a line, so the small, almost a line there. And you have some form of relationship between the model size, the compute size, the, uh, and the performance. And what you see here is that if we plot the Llama 2, uh, which was the best open source fa model family at the time, if you plot this performance to size, you do see that we're much above. Uh, we are above, and you can make some form of extrapolation of the equivalent Lama size, uh, which is in between 13 to 25b, depending on the on the benchmark. So really, that tells I think the world that there's still a lot of things to be done to make very small models, and this is I think something that uh, people are not realizing. So we will be seeing smaller models uh, in 2024, and I believe that we play the part in it. Another thing that we focused on is to try to make the models uh, very efficient at inference. And one thing that is interesting uh, when you look at what are the bottlenecks uh, when you serve a large language models, a large language model is that oftentimes this is not compute, this is rather memory. So if you have a latency critical workload, uh, you are going to be bounded by the amount of memory you have on a GPU. And what takes memory uh, on a GPU when uh, you serve a large language model, where well, you have two things. You have the first thing is our parameters, but parameters are really 7 billion, 3.5 billion if you quantize them to in four. So this doesn't take a lot of memory. What really takes memory is what we call the KV cache, so the key values uh, that you need to store when you do the attention, uh, the attention mapping. And this is really the thing that has the highest memory pressure. 
And as it turns out, when you increase the context length, which is what your model can see in order to reason about it, well, the memory pressure increases linearly with uh, the, the context size. And that's because when, by definition, the transformer, uh, each, every token in the transformer attends to every previous token in the vanilla version. And that means that you need to keep every token in memory to continue sampling new tokens. And how do we solve that? Uh, we've proposed a new architecture, which is actually not a new architecture, but we revived some old architectures from the previous uh, 20, from something from 2019 called Longformer. And what it is doing is the following. So instead of having a model attending the 16K tokens that came before, you have every token only attend the previous 4K tokens. And in doing that, you, you still have a very large context length because you have information spreading across depth. This is the, the, um, the picture you see on the right. Uh, you, you have some form of information that spreads across depth, very similar actually to uh, convolutional neural, neural networks. Uh, you have some form of um, uh, effective attention. And the good thing about that is that instead of having your key values stored, the 16K key values stored, you always keep 4K key value stores. So you've basically reduced by four times the memory pressure. And when you're considering workloads that involve, that are memory bound, so that are blocked by the amount of memory you have to dedicate on your GPUs, well, you've just made it four times cheaper. So this is one of the things that makes uh, Mistral 7B also interesting. It's small, but it also has small memory pressure. It's the first step. There's still many things to be done to try to reduce this memory pressure. The, the KV cache is, I think, one of the most outstanding problems in the generative AI space. We do use too much memory uh, to serve models. So that's something that uh, we made a first step to improve. So what does Mistral 7B does? Um, we've, uh, we've, we've dedicated a, a lot of engineers uh, to actually make it available everywhere. So it's now available on the free large hyperscalers. It will soon be available on Scaleway. Um, it's used by many uh, companies uh, as a replacement of uh, OpenAI APIs. Um, it's, and I think for us, the most rewarding part is that it's been used in many open source projects, also as a drop-in replacement for closed source uh, models. The good thing with open source projects that built themselves on top of proprietary APIs is that now if you move on to a model which is fully a page 2.0, uh, you now have a fully open source stack, so that which creates a full independence uh, from uh, proprietary solutions. And we believe that in many cases, and in particular uh, for applications led by governments, for applications led by regulated industry, this independence is going to be critical for productionization. And so that's really something that, uh, that we've started to enable. So it, um, it empowers open source projects, uh, it empowers commercial applications. There's it's been also uh, very interesting derivative work uh, that are enabled by the fact that the, the license is super permissive. And so Mistral 7B runs on your phone. Uh, this is a picture that uh, uh, someone sent me uh, on, uh, I think, two, yeah, two, two days ago. Apparently, it only works on iPhone 15 uh, to, be, to be continued, but we expect that such model size is going to be available on smartphones. And what it means is that it's private by design because it runs locally, so it doesn't go to, to, to the cloud. So it also runs on your MacBook, especially if it's a MacBook Pro. Uh, it runs at very high speed. It runs at 25 tokens per second. Uh, which is great because you can't read at that speed. So uh, that's the, something that has been quite exciting for us. Um, we've seen very interesting derivative work. So if you have access to the base model that we released, you can actually take new data set, uh, use new techniques to, to uh, upcycle the model and modify it to make it better. And that was really our intention, releasing the base model to have a community of people that would uh, contribute new ideas, new data sets, uh, new paradigms to make the model better and to build new capabilities. Uh, so good examples are uh, there's three of them. Uh, one of them was built by uh, our friends at Hugging Face. Uh, so they took 
our model and use some new techniques revolving around uh, direct preference optimization to make a model called currently Zephyr 7B beta, uh, if it's still in beta. Um, and this actually is currently the best instructed model out there uh, of 7B. Uh, our instructed model was, was good, but uh, very soon uh, Zephyr made a better version. So it's great because we believe that fine-tuning is something that can be led by the community because it's not something that is compute-intensive. So it's really, it calls for a lot of creativity, and creativity uh, comes oftentimes from large crowd. We've seen also new uh, capabilities, so longer sequence length. Uh, there's um, a model called the Armistral 7B 128K, uh, which, as its name uh, announces, uh, has a 128K sequence length. Uh, which is great because you can read most of uh, books with, with this sequence length. Uh, and once again, these were made by, uh, by uh, like, um, open source projects uh, very, with very strong people. Uh, something quite fun is that there's also a version called Mistral Trig Mistrus 7B uh, that has occult capabilities. Uh, so it can talk about different things related to ghosts and people coming out of the from the dead. And, and as it turns out, the base model wouldn't do that pretty well, but this one does it very well. Uh, so once again, a very nice collaboration. Um, so that's, the, that's Mistral 7B. Uh, what's ahead? Nothing to announce, obviously. Um, we will have some new open source models, obviously. Uh, we're currently working on Scaleway uh, Superpod, which is working great. Uh, there's new science. We started, we are scientists. Uh, all of the team is made of scientist people. Uh, there's much to discover, as I've said, uh, new paradigms to invent, better reasoning, uh, better memory capacity, better efficiency in training, many things to be built. Um, there's, uh, on the business side, we're working on a hosted solution. We're working on self-deployed platform. This is something that is already available on our website. We're working on better things. Um, and obviously, we're working on optimized, verticalized models. So the roadmap is pretty packed uh, for next year. Um, I think I basically did 17 minutes, so we can have some pretty long Q&A. Uh, another thing is that uh, the team is growing. Uh, we're actually re recruiting people on the AI side, so really the life scientists of, uh, of computer science, uh, people that would run experiments and make them better uh, with various iterations. We do have a lot of compute to offer. Uh, we're also recruiting uh, engineers uh, for our platform work. Uh, we're recruiting in the business side uh, because we need to talk to a lot of enterprises that have been reaching out and we are currently at capacity. Uh, so if you have uh, one of these intentions, feel free to reach out and uh, we'll be in touch. Um, I'm happy to take any kind of questions uh, and thank you for your attention. Bonjour Arthur, David Berebi, groupe Prisma Media Vivendi. Comment est Mistral avec la langue française Alors Mistral, c est, c est, I should probably speak in English. Uh, Mistral 7B is, uh, was trained on English only, so it's very good at English. Uh, we have made a lot of progress on the multilingual capabilities recently. So we do have some very strong multilingual models. Uh, this is all based on what data you train it on, uh, and we've done a lot of progress on that. Obviously, we are very keen to have models that speak French. Uh, bonjour, Laurence Benamou, Agence France Presse. J'ai lu dans la presse américaine et dans le Financial Times que vous, allez, vous êtes en train de lever 400 millions d'euros. Est-ce que c'est vrai no, We never comment fundraising issues. Hey Arthur, my name is Nico from TFS, nice to see you here. You set up there that um, with the help of Scaleway, uh, you're planning on, on, on training and deploying new open source models. And if I heard well, the CEO of Scaleway this morning, he echoed that uh, announcement talking about, yeah, but I was not clear. Can you say a little bit more as to what's coming down the line after the 7B? And what you're training, even if you're not releasing, um, yeah, we'll have things coming up. Uh, obviously, we are not going to, st to stop at, uh, at the small model size. Uh, and we currently, yeah, we are using uh, Scaleway Superpod currently, and that's working very well. Two seconds. You are a lot. And 
Beware of frost. Hello, Arthur. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for what you did for the community. Uh, my question is more about you. What's keeping you up at night, and how can we help you as a community to bring Mistral, to make Mistral stronger and better? So I sleep very well, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's no, no issues there. Uh, I think we're really uh, welcoming any kind of uh, community contribution. Uh, derivative work is a great way of, uh, of doing things, coming up with new data sets, new ideas, creative ideas. I mentioned this occult work, but, uh, which is quite fun, but uh, if you have access to a data set which is fun, uh, which is potentially unique to you, you can create a fun chatbot. So uh, I think something that we've been missing out uh, in, that, uh, well, in that field, uh, especially the last year, is that everything was very serious. Uh, really, we're talking about generator of text. You can make very interesting, creative things. So uh, that's something that we are very welcoming. Uh, that's something that we will be actively encouraging, um, engaging with uh, teams that have very creative ideas. On the data set side, on the application side, on the science side as well. Uh, as I said, many things to be invented. It's hard today to be a scientist in the field because you do need to have compute. Uh, it's easy to have good ideas, and these are ideas that we'd like to promote. Yeah, I would like to know uh, how difficult is it to do like domain adaptation with Mistral. Um, uh, if I want like to teach it, like to be very good on a specific uh, language uh, of like some professionals or what? So language is something that you probably don't want to domain adapt too much. So if you have a pre-trained model which is speaking only English, uh, it's a bit hard to make it speak another language later on. So you really want to start with multilingual languages, uh, multilingual models. Uh, that's one thing you, it's pretty hard to domain adapt. Uh, it's similar with code, like taking a language model that is bad at code. Mistral 7b is good at code. It's pretty hard to make it good at code. So you don't want to domain adapt too much. That's the purpose of pre-training. Uh, when we pre-train a model, we try to cover as much domain as possible. Uh, now, it's, um, once you have this coverage, you can actually allow any kind of modification to the model with just a few examples, and it's going to work well. So really, the magic of generative AI is to have a pre-training that covers most of the space, and then you only need a few examples to, to show the model the task to resolve. So that's, the, that's how we solve domain adaptation. There's no domain to adapt because every domain is covered. <coughs> Hello. Um, so you mentioned uh, running on, on device, uh, the model, uh, so iPhone, MacBook, um, but what are the main uh, challenges in, in the long term to get like regular people to, to run uh, your model uh, on device? I think it's happening. It's a uh, hard thing to do is that um, ideally when you deploy on devices, you probably want to be slightly smaller than 7B. Um, Something that hasn't been increasing very fast, as you've noticed, is the memory capacity of smartphones. Uh, as it turns out, the memory capacity of smartphones is bounded by the battery capacity of smartphones. And this, w this is one of the things that follows a very slow Moore law. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the reason why you still have 8 gigabyte uh, smartphones. And if you have a 7B model and you deploy it on 8 gigabyte uh, memory, well, you don't have a lot of memory left. So that's, the, that's I think, a standing issue, which means that uh, models should probably be slightly smaller. Uh, and, um, but there's still a lot of leeway to make them smaller. So there's some, I expect that uh, improvement will be more made on the software side than on the hardware side. Uh, but we can also expect some interesting things on dynamic memory, uh, so memory that don't take too much battery, but is only used, uh, well, that only wakes up when used. So really, I think uh, that edge device, LLM on edge devices, is going to be a very interesting thing. Uh, the good aspect of it is that, first of all, it doesn't bear uh, a large uh, cloud cost, so that's good. And it's private by design, because sometimes if you want to have, if you have to have like private conversation with a chatbot or anything that is related to your private life, then maybe you don't want it to, to land on the cloud. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities in that field indeed. Uh, hello, uh, Theo Ding, uh, data scientist for Total Energies. Uh, I had a question about the sliding window uh, of context. Uh, you said you had like 4K uh, length of tokens. Does it mean that in theory, if you have enough time to process everything, you can have an unlimited 
amount of tokens that you can process? So you don't really have unlimited because you're, it's like CNN. So um, you, have, um, like you have a local window, and since everything is connected, and if you look at basically the support of your gradient, uh, you have uh, the, the size is, I think, 132K. Um, and that's because you multiply the, the size of the, of the sliding window with the depth. Uh, so in theory, uh, you have a very large um, uh, sliding window attention. You still need to do a little fine tuning uh, to make it happen. It doesn't happen naturally. You need to have a uh, like very long document to teach the model to do the propagation that is enabled by its architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk and thank you very much for um, your contribution to the uh, community. I have a question about uh, uh, the community. Do you uh, plan to publish uh, research papers about like uh, improvement on neural network architectures? So we have released a research paper on the, on, on the architecture side. Uh, this is not the focus of the company. Uh, we're, um, we're really about uh, shipping things at work. Uh, we all, all come from the academic space. So we do know how, how long it takes to write papers, how long it takes to review them. Uh, we will be uh, publishing. Uh, we will be sparsely publishing. Okay. We have, I think, time for one, two. Um, thank you, Archer, for your speech. You mentioned the KV catch as one of the bottlenecks in uh, model training and performances. What do you think are the next challenges for performances and training? Thank you. Well, you do. There's many things to be invented. The thing is that uh, one issue with uh, transformers is that they spend the same amount of compute on small, on small, on uh, easy task and hard task, and this is an unsolved problem. You probably want to spend more time on on prediction tasks that involve more reasoning. Uh, this is not something that anybody has solved. Uh, that's probably one of the key to moving on to the next generations. Um, being able to also locate good data is, uh, is a very important thing. Uh, being able to leverage better the hardware we have is also quite important. Uh, in that setting, companies like us uh, are very interested in working with hardware providers. And uh, yeah, many uh, reasoning, adaptive compute, better hardware utilization, better data. That's, the, that's probably the, the ingredients of the next generation. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the size of the parameters uh, in both ways. So uh, from your perspective, how small do you think you could get and have the same performance of 7B? So how small could you imagine a, a model could get? And the other side, what would be on the other side? What would be the um, size uh, that big that would create something very different with your technology? It's hard to say. Uh, I can't give you a number.